Welcome to the Mega Culture presentation. Paul Gauchy says, over time you get a higher and higher yield with less and less input. So what is Mega Culture? Mega Culture describes which techniques and technologies produce the best quality, the highest yields and the most reliability in food production all year round. And it's our concept to consider combining all of these approaches. So the aim of the presentation is to explain how we can produce very high quality crops. Crops, if they're grown outside, resistant to frost, drought and most pests. We'll be explaining what are the basic techniques and the results. And examining which technologies we can use for a next generation approach to food production. And discussing some of the benefits and limits of applications. So we're going to be covering technologies to support excellent plant growth and nutrition. Organic permaculture, electroculture, aquaponics, magnetism, light, sound, rock minerals and almus. And the aim is just to stimulate your own interest in research. But here's the motivation. Absolutely fresh, absolutely organic, top quality food for yourself and your family all year round. Here's the other part of the motivation. Because I don't like to dig, I don't like to weed, and I don't like to fight against nature. Permaculture was created simultaneously in a couple of places at the same time. Bill Mollison and David Holmgren are probably the most famous contributors, and they started in the 1970s, designing ways of overcoming the Australian desertification issues. And meanwhile, Sepp Holzer was also working in Austria, this time in the mountains. And permaculture combines three key aspects, an ethical framework, an understanding of how nature actually works, and a design approach to work with nature. So here's the plot. It's an 80 square meter area, and this is the product only in the first year. The technique came from Back to Eden film, which is free on the internet. And all you do is cut the grass and the weeds. Upon them, you place three or four sheets of newspaper. You cover that with about five centimeters or two inches of compost. On top of that, you add about four inches or 10 centimeters of mixed wood chips, including the twigs and the leaves, etc. And to that, you add a further five centimeters of compost on top. And how it works is that the compost and the wood chips decompose. So when it rains, you get compost tea. And the newspaper itself, with the weight of the compost and the wood chips sitting on top of it, squashes down to kill the weeds underneath. And that forms a membrane. The rotted weeds and the newspaper keep the ground moist. The ground covering is key with all permaculture approaches. Even rocks can be used as cover on the ground. And we can also try things like straw or grass clippings, though they can get a little bit uh, greasy. Uh, leaves and wood chips. But when we're considering things like wood chips, what we don't really want is eucalyptus, just sawdust or bark. So the benefits of this approach are that the ground is kept moist. It forms a seal. And moist ground means that the worms can come up through the newspaper underneath and actually do the digging for you. And the rich organic material that decomposes forms a buffer. And what that means is that you can grow acid or alkaline loving crops alongside each other at the same time. This produces and retains a lot of moisture in the soil. So the wood chips are absorbing the moisture and again acting like a water buffer. And that means the microorganisms themselves can thrive, which is another part of a healthy soil. And the byproduct of that is that little or no watering at all is needed. Really, just the seeds need to be watered for the first few days. And the result is that as this matter becomes added to over time with more and more wood chips, and it decomposes more and more, the weeding itself becomes easier and easier because it becomes more and more like compost, a lighter and lighter soil. And the soil actually conditions itself. So it's absorbing water on the one hand, it's storing it, it's releasing it, and that means it's less prone to overwatering or underwatering. So this highly rich organic soil also absorbs water 
and stores it for the plants and keeps it available through the summer. And the result is that we have very high yields and very good quality crops as well, with very, very little effort. I'm not going to go through the full list, but this is the stuff that we were growing in our 80 square metre plot. A wide range of produce. Exceptionally good quality. And that's the size of the carrots we were producing in the first year. And this is the rhubarb, the first year after transplantation. That's a cucumber, and that is the size of the beetroot we were producing. And this is what happens when you take out the weeds. All of the roots come along with them. As long as you keep adding more wood chips and more compost to the soil, but especially the wood chips. So the benefits are little and very, very easy weeding, which actually gets easier and easier over time. There is no digging. If you dig the soil, you're turning over that organic matter to enable it to dry out in the sun. And that means the smallest, most bioavailable minerals are going to blow away when the wind blows or be washed out of the soil when it rains. So you do not dig a permaculture plot. There is little to no watering, only for the seeds. There's also no thinning of the crops. It's very easy for things like carrots just to push each other away in the soil because the soil is very easy to move for them. It's very light. And that means they're spending less energy trying to actually drive their way through a heavy soil. And using this technique, you can get good to excellent yields, even in year one and year two. In fact, the garden we made was created in the June, and we were planting in the June, and we got great results in year one. Healthy plants means they're generally more resistant to pests. Not completely, though. They're also more resistant to frosts, including the use of the technologies that we use to make them more resilient. There's no nitrogen tie-up in this soil because the cover is on top. You can't overwater it, and because it's living soil, it means you don't need to rotate the crops either. You can plant the same things or just leave a few things to seed year after year after year. And if you're after a natural way to control the insects, spray the plants with a mixture of garlic and chilies and jalapenos. Mix them up in a blender, add water, and then get spraying. And you can even grow in a garden like this throughout the whole winter. Things like beet, parsnips, kale, parsley and carrots. The ground is well insulated and it's soft, so it doesn't freeze as rock hard as clay does. And that can destroy the crops. This ground also keeps the plants and bacteria warm so they can operate for longer. And that means the winter crops get better and better. You can consider various ways to get higher yields out of a garden like this. This is a potato box. You plant the potatoes at the bottom. And what you do through the season is add more and more layers of wood and fill it up with more and more compost. But another alternative is simply to get hay or straw and plant in the middle of that. It decomposes. It keeps the potatoes moist. And it's very easy for the potatoes to grow through that and to produce phenomenal yields. So, there are still some pest problems here. Here's another option, which is the slug fence. Simply using a solar panel, a box to contain a battery and the controller for the solar panel, and having two wires running close together along the fence to deter the slugs from entering from outside. Here's the battery and the solar panel controller. And we can even make our own Tesla spirals to help to draw energy from the atmosphere into the ground. And here is a design produced by Goa Labau, the Thrive Movie Animator. And you can download this plan from our website and produce it yourself with your own 3D printer. We can also consider growing inside all year long using aquaponics, which is fish culture. Some of the misperceptions about hydroponics and aquaponics and growing indoors are that firstly plants need to rest at night. That's rubbish. We know that from the examples of Norway and Sweden and northern Russia and Canada where they have 24-hour daylight and a short growing season. 
and the plants have to grow like clappers just in a few months. However, it should be noted that flowering is impacted by the light, however. So if we want plants that produce fruit and flowers indoors, then we do need to control the lighting conditions to be able to stimulate that. The second misconception is that plants need the full spectrum of sunlight, and that is also untrue. And we know that through certain times of year, again towards the extremes of the planet, where the sun barely rises off the horizon for all day long. The next misperception is that this is not as good as organic food. And often the concept is that plants need to struggle somehow to be stronger. However, that's not true. The fact is that you can get bigger, healthier plants indoors. And there are problems with pollution in the air, acid rain, chemtrails, putting barium into the environment and other chemicals, pollution of the water, and the fact that most soil is actually highly demineralized due to agricultural methods and gardening methods. So the quality of the food in a controlled environment can actually be superior to organic. The air is better and the water is better. The next concept is that it's complicated and takes a lot of management. It's not. All you have to do is to monitor the system, which is normally done through a computer, and know how much and when to feed the fish, and when to plant your seeds, and when to harvest. And the final misconception is that you need a lot of space. The fact is, you need a lot less space than gardening out of doors. So the concept is to use technology layering. We have the potential to add technologies to these to further increase the quality and the quality and the reliability of cropping. And these include the ultra-fine rock mineral product for organic growing, Ernesan and Agrofit. These ultra-fine rock minerals are sprayed onto the leaves of plants and especially under the leaves of plants, typically if grown outdoors, within an hour of dawn, about once a month. And there is a visible difference in the quality of the plants immediately after they've been sprayed. They retain water for longer. They retain the minerals for longer because they've been hypermineralized. They're more resilient. They produce bigger crops, crops that last longer, of a better quality. And then there's ozone tubes, using ozone to treat the water and remove the chemicals from agriculture, for example, the weed killer, the pesticides, and the artificial fertilizers that end up in the water. Then we've got the water imploder as used in blooming the desert. And what they found through use of this technology is that the plants need less water. They seem to hold it for longer and they produce more growth and they're more resistant and resilient to drought, temperature differentials, frosts, etc. Then we've got frequency stimulators using sound and electrical impulses, which stimulate the immunity of the plants and fish, increasing their growth and increasing their quality. Then you've got Ormus or Ormi materials, orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements. Ormus is fermented rock material, which produces smaller particles, which are more easily taken up by the plants. And furthermore, they seem to have an electrical charge attached to them, to again produce phenomenal growth and quality of the plants. And then we have the use of geopolymer in the barn materials to make a radiation proof environment, but also one that unlike concrete, which actually removes the electrons from batteries and people, actually creates a resonant stimulating environment for them. And we know this through the application of biology in Germany, where some factories have actually been removing their concrete floors because they seem to draw the energy out of the workers. The key issue when growing indoors is energy. Obviously, we need to supply extra heat and light. However, this seems to be worthwhile, and it seems to be worthwhile creating an environment like a straw bale and wooden framed barn because of the disadvantages of growing in greenhouses. In other words, the heat loss and the vulnerability to those structures in storms. One area that you may find interesting to look at is the work of Justin Christoflero, who was working in the 1920s and 30s in France using electroculture. Christophe Leroux was creating his own technologies to 
work in with the magnetic and electrical fields of the planet to draw down energy from the air and to insert it into the soil. And here's a picture of one of his devices. And this is how it can be used when stimulating the growth on grapevines. And it can also be used to send the energy directly into the soil. And this is an area that Yannick van Dorn has done a lot of research and practical testing with. It can also be attached to isolated trees, such as a, an old or sick fruit tree. And these are some of the photographs of the kind of results that Christophe Leroux was producing. And that, believe it or not, is a man holding a cabbage. And this is a field of potatoes grown with the electroculture process. Six foot three inches high, with 30 to 35 tubers per plant, with the weight of each tuber from one pound one ounce to two pounds two ounces. So we're talking about 60, 80 or so pounds of potatoes per plant. And these are pea plants growing between seven and a half and nine feet high in 1926. This is an old pear tree which was revivified using the electroculture technology and as you see it's absolutely laden with pears. Now we've got the technology of Dan Carlson known as Sonic Bloom. This uses a 3 kilohertz frequency and birdsong along with a spray on mineral compound to increase the uptake of the mineral by the plants. And if you visit the Sonic Bloom website what you'll find is there is uh, a lot of validation for the nature of the increase in cropping as well as the quality. Now we have Dan Winter's water imploder used in blooming the desert alongside compost, biochar which is used to retain the water and rock minerals. The result is the plants need less water, grow more, have resilience to drought and also frost and pests. Now we have Pete Adams ozone tubes producing ozonated water to remove chemical contaminants from the water supply but also with a growth result in the plants, great drinking quality, and water that acts as a natural disinfectant through the presence of the ozone, which is dissipated very quickly. Ken Roller has done a lot of work contributing to the explanation of almost orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, which seems to make a huge number of very small bioavailable minerals. And these minerals also seem to have an electrical charge and it's produced by fermenting affected microorganisms in water along with black treacle and rock powder and stirred or spun in a vortex. And this provides a theory connecting to many ancient techniques including the techniques employed by people like Rudolf Steiner. It can be sprayed directly onto the plants or poured onto the ground. Next we have HHO also known as hydroxy or Brown's gas and the theory here is that this gas releases hydrogen in a readily usable form and that can be converted directly to energy by people and by plants. HHO is generated by frequencies in electrolysis. And there also seems to be an interesting difference between implosion and explosion of the HHO molecule which is explained on the Rex research site. So what we're coming up with is new theories of plant growth relating to electrical conductivity of plants and trees. The differential between ground and air, which was especially explored by Christophe Leroux in the 1920s and 30s. We're also looking at the concept of super mineralization. So when organic grapevines were grown alongside others and sprayed with the Ernesan Agrofit ultrafine rock mineral above and below their leaves, what they ended up with was five or six years growth in only two years compared to the other grapevines. But also more grapes, bigger grapes, longer lasting grapes. The next theory is the function of hydrogen as available energy for plants. And almost seems to be all about the release of bioavailable minerals and monoatomic elements, so they can be very readily taken up and used by plants to create mega growth. So for further resources, have a look at backtoedenfilm.com which explains the permaculture technique. Also have a look at Holzer Permaculture, Sepp Holzer AT, 
and freshandalive.com, which is Ken Roller's website. Dan Carlson's website is originalsonicbloom.com, and also check out Yannick van Dorn's work on electroculture and magnetoculture.com, and the Rex Research website. The links will be posted underneath the presentation. So we'll just finish with a couple of quotes. Here's a quote from Yannick van Dorn. The results were amazing. The cabbages were three to five times bigger than usual, and the farmer was astonished. That's referring to electroculture. And Rumi said, on a journey, never seek advice from those who've never left home. Thank you for watching the presentation. All of our work is for free. Please consider supporting it. If you like what you've heard, please watch the other presentations. Consider subscribing. Give us a thumbs up. Post any questions under the channel and we will use our best endeavours to answer them. And most importantly, please consider supporting our work through Steemit and Patreon. Thank you very much.